All right, everyone, it is now two o'clock, so we'll get started with our webinar. I would like to say welcome to everybody. And this is our first live program for our virtual Eco Week. So thank you very much for being an attendee and also thank you to the panelists um, as we kind of embark on this new virtual version of our Eco Fair. We will give everyone a couple of moments to get settled and we'll begin our presentation in a couple of minutes. Um, as I said before, in the meantime, if you feel comfortable, please um, tell us where you're joining us from and you can do that by using the chat feature. While you're doing that, I want to remind everybody that this program is a partnership with the Cumberland County Improvement Authority and is a week-long virtual event featuring visits with local artists, live and pre-recorded programming from environmentally-minded organizations, and a daily kids' eco camp each morning at 10 o'clock. Some of those will be live, some of those um, will be posted videos that you can um, access on demand. So please join us today, later at 6 p.m. for Wild Clay, a conversation with Terry Plaskett about locating, excavating, and processing, and also creating with local clay. Please join us tomorrow, Monday, August 17th at 10 a.m. for the Kids Eco Camp Butterfly Symmetry Paintings. That's a video on demand. And also at 10 a.m., Monarch Butterfly 101, Monarch Way Station tagging at Rutgers Cooperative Extension and that will be um, a live program. At 6 p.m. on Monday, we'll do Grow Native with Pamela Burton from RCE, and again, 7 p.m., Exploring Your Watershed from Home, live with Sal, Sal Mangia Fico at Rutgers Cooperative Extension. Right now, I'm pleased to say that we are joined by Lucia Tome and Kristen Nivelle Taylor, who will be speaking with us about an artist residency program in Philadelphia whose mission is to challenge the perception of waste culture by providing a unique platform for artists at the intersection of art and industry. More on that in a little bit. Before we get started, we want to make sure you have a comfortable viewing experience. To that end, it is my pleasure to introduce Marcy Peterson, who will be handling all of our technical needs throughout the program. Marcy has been with Wheaton Arts since 1994. She is the IT director and her undergraduate and graduate studies were in fine arts e-business, marketing, and public relations. Marcy, can you provide us with some tech tips for this webinar? I sure can. Um, and I'm really excited about this webinar. Um, first, I wanted to say hi to everyone and let you know, as a webinar, this presentation, you will see the panelists, but they won't see you. And you can ask them and the host questions in the Q&A. They'll attempt to answer live, um, but you'll also get some typed answers. So please note that if your question isn't answered right away, the material may be covered later in the presentation. To ask a question, type your question in the Q&A box and click send. If you don't want your name attached to your question in the Q&A, you can send it anonymously. Um, if the host replies via Q&A, you'll see that reply in that window. It's different from the chat window. Um, hopefully we've already checked in out the chat feature and I'll be monitoring the chat throughout the uh, webinar. And you will be able to get some more information at the end of the webinar, you'll be able to download that chat too. So while I'm putting links into the chat and uh, those additional resources, don't worry, they're not gonna go away. Um, Attendees can feel free to chat amongst yourselves too. So that's why we wanted to start the little icebreaker and let you share where you're from. Should you lose connection for any reason, please don't worry. Just close your window and go back to your original email and you can join and come go as, uh, as, as you need to. So that is not a concern. Um, to customize your experience, just a little quick tip. I don't want you to take, take it away too far, but up in your upper, left-hand corner, there's a little green icon. If you want to click that icon, you can explore some of the, um, the settings. The only setting that you might need um, for this particular webinar is that if you go into the accessibility setting, um, there's a tab that you can highlight and it'll open up a window where you can actually change the font size of your chat. So if you need um, a bigger font, then you can change that there. And 
couple things before we get started on this great program. I just wanted to remind you that there's uh, three ways that you can support Wheaton Arts. One's through membership, um, the second is through donations, and the third is by purchasing in at shop.wheatonarts.org. And I'm not going to go over all the great benefits to membership, but I'm going to let you know that member, whoops, do get it all. Um, and to let you know that gift memberships are always available. And finally, one last thing is that you're the first to know that starting today, Wheaton Arts is offering 15% off the pottery that's made from the clay that you'll see in this evening's program. As a matter of fact, it's off the entire cart today um, and throughout this week. Um, you support not just Wheaton Arts, but the artists by uh, purchasing these items. And as a special gift, our sponsors and our partners, Cumberland County Improvement Authority, have provided us with eco shopping bags. And for the month of August, every purchase, uh, um, though it is limited in supplies, but every purchase will um, be accompanied by an eco bag. And that's whether you pick it up, whether it's curbside um, shopping or whether you have it shipped, you'll get a free eco bag. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce your host for this afternoon, and that is Pamela Wakeman. Uh, Pamela is a ceramic artist, arts administrator, and educator. She's taught for Rowan University and for Wheaton Arts. You may have met her running the family activities on site at Wheaton Arts. She received her Bachelor of Fine Arts at Rowan University and our Master of Science at Drexel University. Her favorite thing about teaching and creating art is the challenge it presents to finding new approaches to understanding and interpreting the world. Back to you, Pam. Thanks, Marcy, for that great introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for this program, during which we are hearing from Kristen Neval Taylor and Lucia Thome. It is my pleasure to introduce Kristen and Lucia. Kristen Neval Taylor's diverse practice combines drawing, sculpture, and glass, which covers in playful installation. Her process has been described as alchemal and utilizes pseudoscientific experimentation to reimagine our relationship to nature futures. Since 2007, Taylor has taught courses in glass and material studies at the University of the Arts, Tyler School of Art and Architecture, and Moore College of Art and Graduate Studies programs. Lucia Tome is a Philadelphia-based sculptor and is director at RARE, a nonprofit artist residency housed within a construction and demolition recycling center. At RARE, Lucia works with artists and other organizations to create artworks, exhibitions, and programming that challenge the perceptions of waste culture. Lucia, can you tell us a little bit more about RARE? So, here we go, I'm unmuted now. <laughs> hey, great, awesome. Yeah, sure. So I'm going to go ahead and show you guys a few photos. I think uh, Rare is the kind of place that um, you really do have to see in person, but here we are all behind our computer screens. So I'm going to do the best I can to uh, give you a sense of what it is, give a little bit of context um, before Kristen starts speaking. So let me just get my screen share going. Okay. Does this seem right on your end, Pam? Absolutely. It looks okay. great. Um, so RARE is an acronym. It stands for Recycled Artists in Residency. Um, and RARE is housed within a construction and demolition recycling center. And so I'll explain to you guys um, in a second. Oops, sorry. I'll explain to you guys in a second what construction and demolition recycling means. Oh, did I get out of present mode? Um, but this, this image here that I'm showing you just kind of shows you that Revolution Recovery is a big for-profit organization, and RARE is a tiny little nonprofit uh, that's housed within it. So I kind of <laughs> use this graphic to show you that, like, you know, we, we are our guests in their house and, and you know, rely on their facilities. So the types of materials that come through the recycling center, um, 
are what we call clean waste, which sounds a little bit like an oxymoron. Um, but what that means is, um, you know, it's building materials. When a building goes, when a building goes up, um, all of that waste, excess waste material, you know, from drywall to rubble to uh, wood and any type of packaging material, um, all of that excess will come uh, and arrive at the recycling center. Um, so the flow of the recycling center, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor here, um, but the way it normally works, if you've never been to a dump before, it's very similar, even though it's a recycling center, um, uh, trucks will drive in here, and if you can't see my cursor here, I'm, I'm circling a big piece of metal right at the bottom. This is actually a scale that is built into the ground. Um, so trucks will come in and they'll get a weight and then they'll drive all the way to the back of the recycling center and they'll dump all their waste materials in the back here. And from that point is the beginning of the recycling process. So things kind of get pushed around um, and eventually they'll go into this warehouse where there's a, a big sort line. So majority of the materials actually do get hand sorted at the facility where we are. Um, so workers are working here. These are big bays, big holes where they're pulling off of a sort line and sorting and separating different materials. So as you can see from the photo, you can kind of see there's, you know, there's a rubble pile and a metal pile. Um, and though it's by hand, this is actually, you know, the most efficient way that materials get sorted in an industry like this. Um, and let me just back up a slide here. So it's a very tiny site. Um, as you can see, we take about 500 tons of trash a day, which is a really hard number to comprehend. Um, but this is just a sliver, just one little slice of the trash that Philadelphia produced because we get such a, a specific type of waste. It's not your curbside recycling, you know, where you put out your blue bin or you put out your regular trash can and they come around and pick it up. This is all building materials, um, which, you know, makes it pretty much the best materials for artists to pick through. Um, so back in 2010, um, my co-founder or my my co-director, Billy Dufala, approached the recycling center and, and asked them if they could start a program within their recycling center. So it took about three years from 2010 to 2013. Um, it took a while for us to figure out what is the safest way to even navigate an industrial site like this. There's heavy machinery driving around all the place. We have to wear the hard hats and the goggles and the respirators constantly. Um, you know, we really, we really took the time to figure out like how could we create the best opportunity for artists to get access to these types of materials because for an artist you know these piles of trash are a gold mine um, and as you'll see it <laughs> um, so the types of programs that we figured out we we basically divided um, our program into two big categories uh, we have these residency programs where artists apply um, to either be a standard resident or a biggie shorty resident. And a standard resident is from one to three months. Um, this whole studio space that you see in the slide is their studio space. They can, we go outside with them, we collect materials and they bring it back into the studio and can just build whatever they want. Um, and this, this is a good residency for a lot of people who are able to give up that amount of time. Um, but there, you know, is a whole slew of artists who work all day long or, you know, who really don't, couldn't really use, they have a studio space, they don't need a studio space. Um, so as a second, as an alternative to the standard residency, we created the Biggie Shorty program, which is a big project in a short amount of time. Um, and the Biggie Shorty residents come up on weekends or they'll come up after hours and they don't use the studio space, but they instead use the entire yard as their studio space. Um, so we collaborate with them to build really big installations that will all get broken down. We, you know, do performances, you know, it's something that can last over time. Um, it's a, it's a format of a residency that I think is pretty unique. Um, and it really kind of lends itself to being in this, in this world of fast paced trash moving, um, people engage with it in a really exciting way. Um, so I'm just going to go through um, a few different types of projects that we've done before with artists in residence. I think it'll give you a sense of, you know, how people have used the materials, how they've made use of the types of things that come through. I don't want to take up too much time because I know Kristen's going to talk a lot about this. Um, but just to give you an idea of the different types of ways that we've worked with artists before. Um, 
So Shelly Spector is actually a fibers artist, but when she applied to Rare, she applied to work with, uh, with rigid plastics. So when she came to the recycling center, she, instead of collecting a big pile of things and filling the studio full of stuff, she was very particular about exactly what she wanted. And she was picking items out of the piles of trash that had the material and color qualities that she was looking for. Um, so it was really fun to go up in the studio when she was working because she would like, you know, super duper clean everything, polish them and then like array them in these like beautiful assemblage, like almost like a painting um, of different pieces of plastic <laughs> that she'd found. Um, and she ended up making, uh, you can see on the, on the right side of the screen, she made a cart, which is, uh, she makes her own soap out of different like fat byproducts. And so one of the projects she wanted to do at the recycling center was make a modular cart that she could fit into her car that she could take to different sites to do these soap making experiments that she'd been working on. So all of the materials that she found there, she like put together and customized. She like cut out the top of the cart to put the sink in. We found the crock pot. We found the scale. You know, everything was just kind of broken back and put together, but in this very careful way that it could be collapsed and taken apart, kind of like the sewing machine table that you see the little moving image of up in the top corner. Um, she, had a, she had a unique way of coming about it. Um, we also did a project with uh, Kimberly Ellen Hall in 2017, who's a wallpaper designer. Um, and we were really excited to have her come and do a residency. We've, you know, we'd had some We'd had some people come and make drawings, but never as their main focus. Um, and so she spent a lot of time, and you can see in the bottom left corner, she spent a lot of time collecting materials and drawing them, and then she would put them straight back into the waste stream. Um, and one of the most exciting things that she did when she was there was she was making these wallpaper series, which you can see on, on their website, but um, wallpaper series of of people's like collections of things. So we get a lot of like got junk trucks, 1-800 got junk trucks that come through. Um, and so she was taking materials just from one truck, figuring out the name of the person who it came from, and then doing a wallpaper series of just the effects from that one truck. Um, and so that was, that was pretty fun. She didn't take any materials with her when she left. Um, she just came and made drawings, documented things, and, and went on her way, made these beautiful ink drawings that all turned into wallpapers. Um, Slinko is another really fascinating artist um, who was doing a video project. So you can see up on the upper left hand, she really laid out all the different sequences of the video that she wanted to make. And she was, um, over the course of her residency, was capturing different vignettes throughout the yard, um, different moments. You can see she's strapped a, uh, a really high tech microphone <laughs> onto the end of a long stick to be able to record the sounds of the trucks pushing the big piles of trash. Um, and in the upper right corner, that was a really interesting shot. I wish I had one from the other side, um, but we actually attached her camera to the top of a dumpster um, to film the trash as it was spilling out of the truck. So we had a really great time with her trying to figure out these like unique perspective, to get a perspective that you would have never otherwise had of these, um, of this industrial process. Um, and Caitlin Pomerantz and John Heron is another project I, I like to show um, because they, they too did, had a different approach to using the materials on site. They were pulling paper material from the waste stream and, and pulping it in, to make their own version of paper. It was like, you know, collaging of different types of paper. You can see the paper making process um, here where they're, they're casting them onto these screens and all the screen materials that they made, they, they found materials at the recycling center to do that. Um, they actually found some some jeans and shredded them up to make jean pulp. You can see in, in the big image on the left, there's a blue piece of paper uh, pinned up to the wall. And that's actually made from recycled jean, jean paper. Um, and I think that that was, a, it's, that was a pretty exciting project for us to work with because then they took, they actually took these pieces of paper and we went to the Delaware River that is next to us and they were pulling prints off of the edges of the water, like where the, the, water comes in there's kind of like a little bit of a sludge they were laying the paper on top and making these beautiful marbled prints um, of this toxic sludge on these uh, pieces of wonderful paper that they had made um, Lucia I have a question yeah. about that last slide yeah. um, the, the image on the left is uh -huh. that is that a studio facility of rare yeah so this is our studio okay. space um, like the image I, I showed 
we have a big, a big open studio on the second floor um, that is pretty empty when artists show up, where they can come and use the space. Um, so they laid out their big sheets of paper in here. And the, the, the smaller picture on the right down here, where you see the big bales of shredded paper, um, this is actually a neighboring paper recycling center. I don't know why it's progressing. It's a neighboring paper recycling center that we were able to visit with them because they were so interested in paper. We like called up the guys next door and we're like, hey, we have these paper artists. Like, can we come and tour the facility? And it was like a field day for them. Um, it was like scrambling to grab as much shredded paper as they could. Uh, it was really, really fun, but also really exciting to be able to like come in and out of the different types of recycling industries um, with artists. Um, and Lily Cotts Richards is kind of a similar project. Like, how does Rare use its resources in the recycling world to give an opportunities to artists? We we were able to with Lily do this project where she had gotten a grant to make these uh, bales of copper, um, and they uh, they're all copper from different like post-industrial Rust Belt cities on the East Coast. So she's got you know copper from Detroit, copper from Baltimore, um, and she had sourced all the copper. She had gotten the money for the project, but she hadn't been able to find anybody to help her make these bales um, the way that she wanted, and it would be impossible to do by hand or it would take forever. So she applied to Rare to have us help her figure out how to make these bales. Um, so for her entire residency, we were like on the phone basically trying to find a metal scrapyard that could make the bale to the right size um, for her project. And it, we found one, you know, and they ended up being so excited to help artists and have now become longtime friends of ours. But um, that was a really, really fun, exciting project to do. And you know, the bales that she made are, are I think, really wonderful uh, pieces of work um, that are extremely heavy <laughs> and, uh, to move around. Um, and another, I think I only got two more of these to show you guys, but um, one of the other really exciting projects that we've done over the years um, was we worked with Mary Ellen Carroll, was one of our first projects that we did at the Recycling Center. Um, and for her, she's, she's more of a conceptual artist, um, which I, at the time I was having a hard time imagining, you know, what would someone who, you know, works with ideas and makes drawings and, you know, like what, what would they do? How would they utilize the Recycling Center in its, all of its big materials um, to do a project and, and she really blew it out of the water um, and really kind of like showed at least me personally the potential of um, you know a space like this for artists so uh, she actually invented a genre of music it was called waste music um, and we um, she made a whole Wikipedia page for it um, and we we built this amphitheater out of shredded metal bales like big bales of not uh, big bales of non-ferrous metal, uh, and we built this amphitheater, amphitheater, and invited um, a lot of you know whatever you know local musicians that we knew to come, and for one minute only, they would uh, shred like metal music like as hard as they could on this shredded metal bale amphitheater, um, and we and Mary Ellen recorded it and and stitched the film together. Uh, and made it look like a montage of a music festival that you missed. So there was no audience here at this music festival and it was like a really funny sort of like facade invented music festival that never existed. But if you watched this video, you would be 100% convinced that it was like an actual music festival um, of people shredding metal on shredded metal. Um, and it ended up being a show uh, at the ICA Philadelphia in 2014. Um, that was a pretty exciting <laughs> a pretty exciting project for us. Um, and Jay McCary is another one too, another filmmaker um, who who used the site in a in a wildly unique way. Um, instead of working with the materials on site, uh, Jay uh, collaborated with the dust. So it, the recycling center is not stinky at all, believe it or not. Um, the type of waste that comes in really doesn't have too much of a smell, um, but it is extremely dusty. And so when Jay got there, um, she knew immediately that's what she wanted to work with. And so she started filming, um, you know, the ways in which uh, dust can take over the recycling center after hours. And so we staged these really big dust clouds where we would sweep the entire yard, with these big industrial broom machines, and then we would push them into these enormous dust clouds. And she would have, she would have like choreographed um, like dancers in them and the video, she had like a full video crew there. Um, and the documentary or the, the film that she made is 
absolutely gorgeous in the most toxic way you could imagine. Um, it's a really, really beautiful uh, piece of work that she made in, in her time at Rare. Um, and I thought a really unique way of using this site. Um, I'm just gonna skip through because I want to, well, I'll give you Jeff. So Jeff Williams, I got two more. I won't take up any more of Kristen's time, but uh, Jeff Williams um, was a large scale sculptor who works out of uh, Texas and New York. Um, and I, I like to just show these photos of his project because I think, you know, he, he too used the, the materials in, in a super interesting way. These are actually car hoods. We got in a big load in our Delaware facility um, of uh, pieces of recycled cars. Um, and what we did for him was uh, we flattened them out with a big piece of machinery so that they were like really smushed flat. And then he used the component piece to build this enormous sculpture on the at the facility in Delaware, um, which is like kind of like a minimal, I don't know, really, I think just turned into like a really beautiful like abstract and he did different, several different configurations of it. Um, but I thought it turned out really well and, and kind of used the material in a way that like transformed it um, and its scale even. I think if you saw not a person standing next to it, I don't think you'd, you would really have any idea um, about the weight and scale of this type of project. Um, you know, and I feel pretty fortunate to be able to work with the artists at the Recycling Center and be, you know, uh, surprised by the ways in which um, the, they're able to innovate the industry or like innovate their practice within the industry. Um, and I think that Kristen, you know, is normally in my slideshow when I give a talk like this because, you know, the way in which Kristen came about working at Rare too, I think fits in so well to this like, you know, if you had access to a front end loader, if you had access to, you know, drones and big heavy equipment and car hoods and, you know, unlimited piles of dust, you know, if you had access to an industrial shredder, like what could you do to make work there? Um, and I think Kristen did a wonderful job uh, and made these massive pieces of work um, that I'm sure she'll tell you about in the coming minutes. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I, I'll be here the whole time if you guys have any more questions. I think we might do questions at the end. Um, I, you know, tried to keep it short, but if you, you know, check out our website, please. And, you know, there's uh, hours of, of things that you can flip through and projects that we've done over the past uh, seven years. So thank you so much. Oops, did a stop share. I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> Thanks, Lucia. Um, so I, I have, I'm going to share my slides now. Um, I just want to make sure with time, um, I was going to introduce my practice a little bit and then talk about rare, but if it's more interesting or better to like get to the conversation, I can just skip to my rare experience too. So what, how are people? I, feeling? Yeah, I think it'd be nice to have an introduction. Okay. Cause, Cause some people might have not seen you when you were at Wheaton. Um, and it'll be a nice introduction so everyone kind of gets uh, context. Okay, thanks, Pam. And thanks for You're the welcome. intro. Um, yeah, I have, a, I have a history with Wheaton. I was an intern there right out of school and demonstrated Pat DeVere for the public um, and would uh, sneak over and have coffee with Terry, who's giving the <laughs> Wild Clay um, workshop later. So um, love Wheaton. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now. And then just talk to you a little bit about, um, is everybody seeing every, everything okay? Yeah, um, looks good. Okay, great. So I'll just talk to you a little bit about my um, experience at Rare in 2017, and also um, just give you a short introduction now of um, what my practice is like to give you some context for the work that I did there. Um, and so um, for me, um, art has always been a tool for learning uh, and asking questions. And usually those questions are about nature and the systems and stories that have shaped how I've come to understand it. Um, and so as you'll see, a, um, a lot of my work tends to be environmental, but it also encompasses lots of other topics and concerns, um, none of which are unrelated. This photograph was taken in front of my um, husband's wood shop in West Philadelphia, where we live. Um, I had um, for so long wanted to do a project with solar power and this is the moment that I've figured that equipment out and I was really excited. 
Um, so um, I think of myself as a materials-based artist, though I do have a background in glass making. Um, and so my practice is not limited to one medium or discipline. I often make my creative decisions based on where materials come from, what they're made of, and their social, political, and environmental history. Um, and then they, the, all the things that I make usually find their way into larger installations like this one. So this is um, an installation that I did um, called Forevermore. Um, and I revisited Mary Shelley's Frankenstein through an environmental lens. I split the room into two halves. So one side featured lots of glow in the dark glass uh, to represent a kind of fantasy of nature. And the other side featured uh, sculptures made out of a refrigerator, thermostats, lots of aluminum foil, and was modeled after a laboratory to uh, reflect on the future. This is one of the sculptures um, that I call Portal. Um, it's an archway made out of glass daisies. Um, and it represents the passage between the world um, as Dr. Frankenstein knew, uh, knew it and the new world he called into being when he brought the creature back to life. So it's also meant to resemble a wedding arbor um, and um, to sort of reflect the relationship that humans have with nature and the ways that we perpetuate a fantasy of nature through stories. And this is a detail. So the, all the daisies are made out of glass through different glass making processes. Um, and then there's a fluorescence that's added to the glass that um, can resist high temperatures um, and uh, glows in the dark under a UV light. So um, I, in my work, I often rely on texts like Frankenstein um, and research to guide me in making decisions about how to create a visual narrative for an audience. And so in 2016, I had an exhibition called Works and Days that was, um, I was thinking about um, an article that a group of scientists had published at that, around that time that detailed um, a new epoch they were calling the Anthropocene, which is a word that maybe you're tired of hearing. Um, but uh, their report was illustrating how layers of rock was proving the impact that human behavior had on the climate. And so for me, I started to reflect back on the beginning of agriculture. And as a big fan of the Farmer's Almanac, um, I wanted to seek out the earliest example of that, um, which from what I found was Hesiod's works and days. So for this show, I put together a bunch of sculptures, found objects and drawings, to explore ecological and political events, as well as everyday conduct that characterized life in Philadelphia and ancient Greece. Um, this is one of the, uh, this is a large pat de bear casting. Um, so it's a glass casting um, that's called, modeled after a climate map, um, but it's also um, uh, about the history of the technique itself. So pat de was often used to replicate fresh, precious stones to fool and impress the elite. Um, so beyond traditional art materials like glass and wood, um, I'll often use uh, household materials or found objects like um, aluminum foil. Um, so using common materials allows me to collapse the divide between art and everyday life. And so one thing that I collect is coolers because they're a common accessory of workers like my dad. Um, and this piece is called labor to leisure and it's also a fountain. So the water moves from the bottom cooler to the top and slowly streams down the side like as if the coolers were crying or sweating. I also have another collection project um, that's called Spears for Athena and it's ongoing. And so I make these weapons from trash that I find mostly on walks in Philadelphia. Um, and the idea originates from a story that I learned about Sigmund Freud, that he had these three prized possessions that he um, escaped Austria with. And one of them was an Athena statue that was missing a spear. Um, and he, Freud would actually, I mean, maybe you already know this, but he would often reference like his objects in his writings. And he equated uh, Athena's missing, um, spear with uh, her longing for a phallus, saying that she was characterized by her longing for this missing spear. So for me, um, making spears out of things that I can just f easily find is kind of a redemptive action. Um, and then um, what I'll do is take these spears and then give them context through larger installations. So um, I showed the spears in this exhibition te called Temporary Stay in 2017, um, and it's based on the essay by Ursula Le Guin called The Carrier Bag Theory of Fiction. Um, and it's 
in this essay, she challenges this like predominant idea that centers stories um, where weapons and uh, domination um, take center stage. And, and instead she posits that the container or the vessel is the hero of stories. And so the center platform had lots of vessel sculptures um, and other found and made objects. And then around the room, I had um, the spears would frame these pat de -Bear tablets that I had made. So for my work, in my work, I'm often pairing uh, what you might call like a refined material like glass with trash or ordinary objects. objects. And so that kind of is the way I was thinking about contextualizing my um, uh, experience with Rare For You is that as someone who is in the habit of working with these easily commonly disposed of items like coolers or trash that Rare had always been intriguing to me. Um, and then um, finally in 2017, um, I submitted a proposal that was accepted and had a residency there that summer. And here I am in a rare bathroom selfie, um, rare, rare bathroom selfie um, in my uniform, my safety year. Um, so I was really excited about the opportunity, but like as Lucia said, it's really hard, no matter if you've been on a tour um, or if you've, um, you think you understand how um, it, it might operate when you get there, it's, it's impossible to know until you do it. Um, so every day uh, we would make frequent trips to the yard um, and as things that I was interested in came through, Billy and Lucia would help me pull those things um, out of the trash. And so it all happens really fast because it's, it was really important to not be a distraction or a danger to the people that were working um, at Revolution Recovery. Um, and some of the things that I can see that I pulled aside are like a buoy and a plant. I can see some photographs. Um, and so we would set those aside and bring things up later to the studio. And um, because it, it was hard to make creative decisions in that moment, I would often collect things um, that I, that might even have a hint of a possibility of being useful for me later. Um, and then you, you, you do all your editing, curating and decision making in the studio. So here is, um, some of the rare flare that I collected from the trash that I used to adorn my safety vest. I found, um, for me, I was really interested in the 1-800-GOT-JUNK trucks. So there was lots of construction material and there was things that I collected from that, but I was definitely drawn to like the personal items, the photographs, um, the objects that people were living with. I found all kinds of things like someone's entire um, Girl Scouts collection of clothes and ephemera. And I still have it though, I'm not sure it have, has any art potential for me, but it's just so beautiful. Um, there, I found shark cartilage, like just showing some ra of the random things that I, that I have. I started um, a collection of abandoned house plants. For some reason when I was there, microscopes kept coming through and I couldn't say no to them. I still have all of them and other lenses um, as well. And I would just experiment with these lenses and make my own optical devices. Um, and you could actually, if you, if you tried, you could see the Delaware River from the studio. Um, and there was a solar eclipse during my um, time there. And so I, I exper experimented with, with some of my homemade optical devices um, on the roof that's just outside of the studio. And so Rare really lends itself to these kinds of like five minute sculptures because it's so fast and furious. I'm just gonna play this video of um, a sculpture that I made with a tide brush and a spaceship. And really because I was there and I'm gonna share the larger project I was working on later, um, there was lots of time to experiment and play. I would say play was like um, what was a main part of my time at Rare. It's very, um, freeing and uh, operates in such a different way than I was used to in my studio practice. Um, so the one thing that I was really drawn to from the construction sites were these like highly technical fabrics. And so uh, this is a photo of Billy helping me take a big roll of this silver insulation material back to the studio. And I started to make these quilts. Um, there was like two sides to it. One side was a little darker and one side had this like um, sort of rainbow um, shiny side to it. Um, 
this is a photograph of the studio and me working on one of the larger quilts. Um, and I also became really fascinated with the role of water in the recycling process. So um, like Lucia mentioned, there's so much dust and I had no idea how much water was used every day to just keep the dust down. And it would collect down behind the piles in this swampy mess. And so I created this very technical device to collect some of the water. Um, and then I have this video of Billy helping me. Oh, it's so shallow. Should we see what the consistency of it is? Yeah. Oh, it's pretty gross. Pretty perfect. Go a little bit deep. Oh, so I would took it upon myself to try to make water filters to clean that water. And as you can imagine, people throw everything out that you need to make a custom water filter, including grass seed. Um, other things that I found, I was um, really surprised to keep finding all of these uh, natural specimens. So there's big pieces of coral, fossils that aren't even shown here, um, a collection of bees and a stuffed pheasant. And these were from different clean outs. Um, and, and when things start to come in like that, that get you excited, for me, I would get excited and I would kind of be hungry for more with each new clean out. And I actually started to try to configure them into this light box. A lot of other materials will actually come from these trade shows and they've hardly been used. So this light box was like maybe used once at a convention. Uh, but the main reason that I had come to Rare was to, uh, and what I had proposed was to expand this series of sculptures that I do called Pre-Modern Pulverizing, where I take everyday objects, assuming that they might one day be able to tell a story of how we're living now and then I crush them and turn them into balls. Um, and so this is so that I can take away their history and allow them to easily defy categories. And I've shown them in a piece called Notices and Wonders um, that's inspired by a teaching assignment of the same name where students are asked to say what they see rather than what they think they know. And, and this piece was inspired by anthropologist Severn Foles um, who has an essay, I think it's called People Without Things. Um, and he urges um, people to take a closer look at non-things, absences, lost and forsaken objects, rather than privileging the artifact to tell stories. And I, the whole point is to not tell people what they are, but I always share this image of my studio of things that I've shredded. Um, so there was like a Donna Summer record, um, Whole Earth catalog, tennis shoes, toothbrush, like some things that have value possibly in, and then mostly ordinary objects. You can also see like my cooler collection in the background. Um, and then this is me in my studio with my Ninja Blender um, that I use to shred the objects, usually in batches, and then shape them together like a snowball using um, uh, water and glue. But at Rare, I had the opportunity to use this machine um, to really scale up the project. So every Saturday at 1 p.m., uh, Revolution Re Recovery staff and uh, Rare staff would help me run the machine. So I would set aside objects. Um, because it was a new um, experience for Rare and Revolution Recovery, we were limited to materials. So it was wood objects mostly, just to take, make sure the machine didn't get destroyed for a sculpture. Um, and, um, I'll just play a video of it in action. It was always really fun to watch some, I think I could watch things be shredded all day long. And it was always way more material than um, I could anticipate. Um, and so this is one of the loads, um, I forget, I think this might've been the desk. Um, uh, and then instead of shaping it by hand, I had to make molds. So I used materials from the trash. So there's a the underside of a Weber grill. And then I used a yoga ball um, and a bag of cement 
uh, to make the, the mold in the background. And I would make them in two halves um, using just glue and water and then um, ratchet strap and glue them together. And then this is the bench and ball form. So the, I think the biggest that I've made one is 30 inches. So in my mind, I was like, I'll be able to do a 15 foot ball. Um, so maybe one day I'll get there. Um, and then um, I, later I had the opportunity, uh, later that fall, I had the opportunity to show um, some artworks that were conceived during the residency at Vox. Um, and so for me, I'm often responding to like this research and these texts that I'm working with. And Rare was really this kind of responsive and like intuitive experience for me. And so I ended up calling the show Signals Catch and Release based on um, the fishing term um, for throwing fish back into the water. But here I was like releasing images and objects back to the world. Um, I was also really thinking a lot about this miracle of trash, how it's this great social service that we often take um, for granted. And actually the large quilt in the back um, is in reference to like a barn, ra barn raising quilt. Um, and so I like this idea that something that um, something that is made easier and ceremonious um, by a group. Um, and so for some of these artworks, I was thinking about um, individual versus collective actions. Um, this is a water filter that I made. Um, so the container might look familiar to people, um, especially in Philadelphia. It's a tire that's been turned inside out. Um, and here I've converted it into a DIY um, gray water filter. Um, and so I was, um, I'll show you this detail shot. So basically the idea was that the water would collect at the top, it would move through all of these materials and come out the bottom um, through the, there's like a, a water fountain spigot at the bottom and it would come out drinkable. Um, so I wanted to make this idea of municipal water visible. Um, and so I wouldn't claim that it really functions, but for me it's more uh, about its imaginative potential than its design value. Here's another uh, installation shot. And then um, this, so I was making the balls, but then um, I just kind of got, got inspired when I was there to make this, like I call it like a debris tower. Um, so this is a shredded office desk that came through and it had all of the, the files and pens and papers still inside. And actually it was fun to get up close and you can still see some like meeting notes um, in some of the pieces. Um, and inside, I installed a stereo and um, public speaker, public address speakers um, that played world weather that was tuned to this frequency that um, this, this like pseudoscientist claims to have cleaned the water after the BP oil spill with. Um, and that was actually powered by the solar panel from the first slide. And then inside, I put all of the um, natural museum type objects that I collected at Rare, like the fern, fossil, coral, um, and here's like a detail of the, the common pheasant in there. And actually like the reason I was inspired to make this piece was when, we, when I was making the, um, like putting all the objects inside that light box, all of the, um, the fossils and rocks, Lucia came into the studio and said, um, oh wow, you're making a natural history museum. And I thought, oh, how boring. And I really wanted to like push it and kind of subvert that idea, um, so. Thanks, Lucia. <laughs> um, and then you can see the solar panel there in the window. It like fit perfectly and swung like um, a win like a window shade. Um, other, th I mean, I was really drawn at rare to like the uh, shiny things, and there was these fluorescent light shades uh, that I ended up putting together in this kind of minimalist sculpture uh, with a hurricane lamp inside. Um, but for the exhibition, you can't see it in this. Um, this shot, but there was two-way mirrors so that the glow of the lamp was more um, discreet and it kind of was like almost like pulsing, like a pulsing red light. Um, I made another water filter that was inspired by um, research um, that these MIT people did uh, where they discovered that it's possible to clean water using um, uh, xy the xylem-shaped filter of sapwoods like pine and cedar. Um, so for me, the work has like a pragmatic function. Um, it shows that uh, simple materials are already creating access to clean water and then a metaphorical function. The branch is shaped like a divining rod um, to help people find water on land. 
And I'll play this video. It's really simple, just dripping, but uh, has kind of like a meditative quality like the, the cooler fountain. And the idea is that the capillary um, like um, structure inside the branch uh, have all these different nodes. And by the time the water reaches the bottom, it's uh, filtered out something like 90% of the impurities. Um, and so this is the last um, piece that I'll show. Um, this is just a found object. And I love that it was this crystal ball that was really beat up by the time it got to the dump. Um, and I showed it in this kind of funny jewelry box. And on the underside, I engraved uh, this quote, don't count on it, um, which is a sentiment that's a direct reference to um, farming and the in inability to predict the weather or um, I think there's a phrase like, don't count your chickens until they've hatched. And so I liked thinking about how, um, even though I really do believe trash is like actually predictable based on human patterns, behavioral patterns, it's much harder on an individual level to guess what you'll come across. It's only when we like zoom out um, that the patterns emerge. And so I like um, ending on this slide. Kristen, we have a question from the audience, kind of going off of what you just said. Um, someone wants to know, is it difficult to see so many useful objects become trash? And how does that feel? Oh, yeah. Should I stop sharing or? Um... Yeah, you can leave that up while you answer it. OK. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's difficult. It, it really is overwhelming um, to see all of these things that, that that seem like they just came from someone's garage. Um, um, you feel like as an artist, I feel I felt like, oh, wow, like there's, there's all this potential in almost everything that comes through there. So yeah, I do think it can be it can be a challenge. Mm -hmm. Your residency there seemed really prolific. Now, what type Lucia mentioned two residency types, which one did you have? I did the standard one. So I, um, I think it was like two months, I forget, um, but that I, I could go there kind of throughout the week um, um, every day and, and just work and sift through the trash. And um, it was interesting to like um, know that I wanted to scale up the balls, but then be limited. I, I kind of felt like it was a gift that I could only use the shredder on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. um, so throughout the week, I could just really like give in to the, um, surprises uh, that the rare that the rare experience has to offer to not know great now i have um, a question about the kind of harmonious existence and maybe lucia can answer this too from her perspective um, but you know at wheaton arts we have a residency program and we very much kind of it's integrated into everything we do and it looks like um, the recycling center as Lucia was describing it, has its own very high volume of material to get through. And I'm wondering how, how that is balanced between artists needing to kind of go in and dig through stuff versus like their need to actually physically go through and sort everything. And how is that balanced approach? Like I think you were saying there were some um, appointments being made like after hours to, to use a shredder or something. Is that typically how it functions? Yeah, I can, I can answer some of that. So the recycling center, you know, being a separate organization that's, um, that is nice enough to let us uh, come and leech off of their materials. I mean, you know, they, like I said, you know, they're, they're moving 500 tons a day of materials. And I would say the artists are picking less than 0.2% of that tonnage every single day. Like, you know, comparatively, it's it's very small. Um, and so there is a lot of like getting out of the way, pretty much that we have to do. <laughs> like their job really is to like, move the material as fast as they can. You know, and so you get a couple artists coming in and say, hold on, like, let me get that. Let me grab that. You know, it's, it's a it's a fine balance of of figuring out where to stand, you know, like Chris was saying, we'd go out and pull materials like as the trucks are dumping. Um, but you kind of have to be like aware of the choreography of the yard to like know where to stand so that you're not going to be in the way, you know, and it, it is really hard to think about that, like the value to of all the materials, just to kind of like, I think it dovetails into 
you know, the previous question about like, is it hard to let things go? You know, it's like, if you're standing there and you see like the most beautiful singer sewing machine you've ever seen in your life, and you, you know how much it costs and you know how much you'd be able to use it. But if it's on the other side of the yard and someone's about to push it, you know, you have to let it go. There's no way. And maybe another one will come in, you know, they think that's the beauty or maybe you'll never see it again in your entire life. But <laughs> that's the kind of fun of it is, is, you know, people throw things away for who knows what reason. And I think, you know, the, the sort of rule of like, you know, it's in the trash for a reason really doesn't work at rare I think you can it's it's really exciting to be so surprised at you know what sort of stuffed pheasants or you know um barbecues or you know even just like pieces of plastic that you find that are very useful but um yeah there is a, did that answer your question kind of the yeah absolutely we do have to stay out of the way we're very grateful to have a window into the world uh because waste industries are very closed door um, you know, if you if you call up a scrapyard and say you're an artist, they're going to slam the door on your face. Um, so to be able to have the opportunity to, you know, get in there is we're very grateful for. And I know all of our artists are too. It seems like the facility itself, um, it's like you're saying, it, there's there's a harmony between a few different staff bodies. When the artists come in, have you ever seen, or Kristen, have you experienced um, like a collaborative community forming with the artists that are in residence at that time? Well, we, we typically only have, oh, go ahead, Kristen. Oh, no, no. Sorry, I was just, with staff, collaborative. No, with, um, I don't know if, if artists, are they existing at the same time in, in the residency program? Did you have like a, a co-resident or is it just kind of one artist? No, we just normally have one at a time. I mean, it's, it's such a high, um, like, I don't want to say like high state, but it's very like, it's very busy and overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And so even for us staff to be in the yard with two artists, it's like, you know, one sees a shiny thing one direction and one sees a shiny thing that direction. And then you're like, who's watching who? Like, hold on, slow down. So, um, you know, it's, it's easier for us and I think more beneficial for the artists if it's one. <laughs> We have recently, though, in recent years, been bringing in overlapping artists, which we're finding to be, like, extremely rewarding because the conversations that, I mean, even alumni have with each other after the fact, I think, are, you know, invaluable. Um, you know, you are creating a community of people when you have an artist residency, like, you know, the Wheaton community knows. And I know we have, I saw in the chat over here, too, there are a lot of overlapping, you know, alumni of both programs and I think that's what's kind of great about um, Philadelphia and the area you know is that uh, you know people are kind of working together and sharing experiences and resources. Lucia I have a question from the audience um, about um, seeing so many possessions move through the center has that changed your views on possessions or even about the ephemeral this, and this is an even bigger one or even about the ephemeral nature of human life individually or as a species? That's a good question. That's yeah. a good question. I, <laughs> I am going to just, so um, like in the chat box, Martha McDonald, who did a performance at Wheaton, who also did a performance at Rare, made her whole performance about that. It was about memory and ephemera and about the sort of like uh, the keepsake that is only important for the person who keeps it. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to think about when thinking about, you know, I mean, as you can see in my life, I have a lot of things too that I do like to keep. Um, but working at Rare, definitely, and I know Kristen probably can relate to it, even just being there for two months, you know, seven years, I have a little bit of a different perspective. I'm just, I'll throw everything away now. You know, I'm, you know, I, I, do, I love recycling, but I, it also has like tweaked in my mind, the idea of the cycle of it all, you know, like I don't necessarily need to keep things. I think, um, you know, I know there will be more and I know that if I'm reusing things or keeping them longer, or, I don't know, I, I do have a, a, a perspective. I think at this point when I walk out in the yard, um, I don't have that like fluttery impulse that maybe I did seven years ago of like, I need it. I need it. I need it. I can kind of just like, like Zen look at the pile and I'm like, Oh, I really could use like a lampshade. I just broke mine. There's a lampshade and you grab it. Um, I think you do, you do kind of develop a, and once you see 
that forever trash will just keep coming every single day, 500 tons a day, and it doesn't stop, I think you kind of realize like, okay, well, what can I do within this? And I think our artists do experience that similar to like your, your role within the role of Yes, for just for a second. Um, Kristen, the same question to you. Have have you noticed um kind of a change in your opinion about possession by your experience at Rare? Yeah, I think it I think definitely my um my uh, other things in research um kind of syncing up with my time at Rare definitely had me feeling has has changed me and um there's something freeing about like putting on an exhibition and saying um i'm just going to put it all back in the dump when i'm done um uh, because i think well at least for artwork for me it's not so much about when i'm sharing it um it's not I, it, of course everything's for sale but it's not in the um it's not for the purpose of um selling the work but for sharing these ideas um and so they're often temporary in that way they're temporary like the exhibition not like a permanent object so i like the idea of um having had that experience of rare thinking about just putting them right back where you found it putting it taking from the waste stream and then putting it right back yeah artists do tend to to hold on to to things for a long time too um and at some point yeah you have to look at it and think you know <laughs> What's the function? Is this for exhibition? Is this not? Should I just get rid of it? <laughs> yeah, I think we all experience that a little bit at some point, like you're saying, and then you start to realize or your space dictates how much you can actually like save versus how much you just have to like let go. And sometimes it's hard. Absolutely. Um, well, if we don't have any further questions or if you guys have anything else to add, um, we are going to share your contact information in a slide that'll be coming up. So if anybody would like to contact Kristen through her website um, or Lucia through her email at Rare, we'll put that up on the screen. And please do check out Kristen's website and also Rare's website to keep up um, to date with the residents that, that they're having. Now, Lucia, do you, do you have current residents now? I know on your website it says that residencies are running. Are they running um, with a current no, climate? We've postponed them till next okay. year, um, you know, for the sake of, of giving the, the space uh, to the people doing the sanitation work and, you know, all of the workers at the recycling center um, so that they can do their work safely. Um, we postponed, we were able to fortunately postpone. Yeah, um, that's terrific. We did the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a quick question. Can I ask oh, one more question? Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering, Kristen, do you reuse like, pieces from work in other works yeah all the time yeah cool okay yeah yeah because I, I find that to be a thing too that a lot of our residents end up doing is they'll you know like you're saying make a five minute sculpture take it apart and or even a longer sculpture and then reuse it in a different um in a different way yeah it kind of reminds me too of like living with objects and um, like having a renewed interest in like maybe a book or Mm -hmm. or something on the shelf and then uh you give it a new life or new meaning um yeah definitely <laughs> well thank you both for joining us it was an absolute pleasure to get to know more about rare and Kristen get reintroduced to your studio practice and to see how you use the facilities at rare to make some pretty incredible work thank you pam Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I believe Marcy, I'm handing it over to you now to wrap it up for us. Sure. And thank both you. with Kristen and Lucia and Pam too, thank you so much. That was so incredibly interesting and inspiring. Um, what I'd like to ask is that our audience participate now and let us know if they have any programs that they'd like to see Wheaton Arts produce or or in their inspiration today um, can they and brainstorming is fine there's there's no wrong answer here if you have something please put that in the chat also um, we have Pam Wakeman on the screen now and her email address and I'm sure she'd be glad to hear from you as well um, 
and I'm going to put my email address in the chat as well um, because I don't know if you can actually download the chat, but I just in case you can contact me if you'd like a copy of the chat. And one last reminder is that um, I wanted, as I mentioned earlier, that, uh, that you are the first to know about the 15% off discount in the stores shop dot wheatenarts.org and um, so so check out those pieces available for purchase online um, and for those who make the purchase whether you're choosing shipping or curbside pickup you will receive that free eco shopping bag and um, again I'm going to put a few last links in the chat and if you have any other questions um, that will um, be on just for a couple seconds longer. And um, again, thank you to our panelists. And, and remember to join us later today at six o'clock where I'll be talking to Terry Plaskett about wild play. Yes, and I also put that in the, that link in, in the chat as well. Um, we've got quite, quite a nice lineup this week. And you can, um, I've also shared the, the link to all the other programs. There's 12 total. And um, Pam's going to, um, during the kids camp, um, have uh, several um, uh, demonstrations. And, it, and it's, mm -hmm. it's gonna be a lot of fun for families, not just kids, but um, th those are really cool and for families. All right, well, thank you all, and there will be a recording available. So we will see you again. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Hope to see you later. Bye now. Right. Bye.